everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for a very special edition of the Return of the King Live podcast. Uh, so on today's podcast, we have a very, very special guest. We are honored to have Dr. Robertson Jenis with us here today. Um, of course, my, I'm, I'm Joe Moreau of the Cup of Joe blog. We have Nina Leone of the Joan Up blog. We have with us Jesse Evans of the Attorney Patrice blog. All of us run and operate and manage Return of the King Live. And today we're going to have Dr. Robertson Jenis, a notable Catholic scholar, apologist, uh, share with us his conversion story, uh, his whole process of what led him into the Catholic Church, his background. And um, we're very excited to have you on. Robert, thank you so much again for being with us today. And uh, with that, um, uh, Jesse, you want to lead us in opening prayer? Yeah, absolutely. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. O Mary, conceived without original sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Salve Regina, Matri Misori Cordiae, Vita Dosheno, et Spes Nostra Salve. A te comamos, exules vile ave. A te susperamos, gementes et flentes, tarha glacri manum vale. E ergo advocata nostra, e los tuos misericordiae, lacios nos converte. E chesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc et stilium ostenti. O clemens, o pia, o dulcis vergo Maria. Order for nobis sancti dei genitrix, o digni of fici armor profesioni vis Christi. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. So, again, thank you so much, Robert, for being here. Um, we're very honored to have you on our podcast. I just want to quickly show our viewers some of the material you've written over the years, because I think I own just about every book you've ever written. But just to give you guys an idea, okay, from Dr. Robertson Jenis, why I left the Catholic Church refuted by Robertson Jenis, Bible studies for Catholics, which is a must own for Catholics by Robertson Jenis, how can I get to heaven, the Bible's teaching on justification made easy, not by bread alone, the single best book ever written on the Catholic Mass and the Eucharist, not by faith alone, the best book ever written on justification not by scripture alone, the best book ever refuting Sola Scriptura and showing the Catholic position for scripture, tradition, and magisterium. And I really want to just let you guys know too, and uh, Robert, you can let them know too before we end the podcast today, but what just got released at robertsongenis.org is full commentaries on the Douay Reims New Testament, ex executed from the original Greek and the Latin from Dr. Robertson Genis. These are the best commentaries on the market uh, that go through the Father's you know, the medievals, the popes, the councils, verse by verse commentary on sacred scripture. So just amazing stuff. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, we had one that just came out uh, yesterday, or was it the day before, uh, on uh, Mark, Matthew, and uh, John. It's nice. a, That's the first volume of the commentary series. Awesome. Just wanted to let you know, that's up for sale uh, now on uh, robertsandgenis.org. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, yeah, thank you again for being here. And if you just want to share with us your background and, and kind of where you came from and what led you to the Catholic Church, uh, you, you have the floor. Yeah. Let me just say, first of all, that, Joe, um, since I've known you for so long, uh, we were just talking about it before the show, 15, 20 years. I mean, that's a long time. And um, we've gotten to know each other uh, pretty well, I think, during that time. And um I just want to, you know, as much as you like having me on here, I like people like you because people that stick it out, you know, because we've had some ups and downs in the church and, yeah. um, and you almost fell off the edge at one time, you know, in the study of Acantism and you came back, yeah. you know, you, you, you love the Lord and you love the Catholic faith and nothing was going to stop you. You know, I, I just felt that in my bones with you. And I, and I was more than willing to help you with whatever I could at that point. But what I really want to say is I, I appreciate people like you and Nina, Jesse, you know, who, who, who just love the faith, love the Lord and look forward someday to getting out of here and going to heaven, you know, and that's what it's all about. And here we are talking to one another in ways that we would never have thought of what 20 years ago, this was impossible to do. And here we are talking about it and time is going so fast. You know, it's the, the inventions, the new ways to communicate, everything's going so fast. You know, that we're, we're coming close, you know, to, to, to the end, you know, 
And this, this is what, if you were to draw it out from, you know, the time even before Christ and, and you saw the progression of man, it, it goes something like this, you know, and we're at that peak of communication, of inventions, of everything. And all it's all coming to a head, I believe. And I'm just so happy to have people like you who appreciate um, the work that I do because I, I try to make it a little different than most of what you see out there because I've always been this way since I was a kid. My mom, used, I used to drive my mother crazy because everything she used to buy, I used to take it apart to see if, you know, see all the parts, how they all work together and then try to put it back together. I wasn't always successful, but that's just the way my mind works. So like when you just showed those two commentaries, you know, they're 750 pages each because I throw everything but the kitchen sink in there, uh, go right to the, you know, the, the core of our faith and try to bring it out. And what I've seen missing in a lot in um, Catholic uh, scholarly work is there's not too many Catholics who really know the Greek language, but that's what the New Testament was written in. The, the, traditionally, we're used to Latin. And Jesse just prayed in Latin, and I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> but I appreciate your prayer. Um, so I know what people like are like when they see my Greek. They're kind of, oh my gosh, what is this guy doing? But I, I try to make the Greek uh, of the New Testament understandable to somebody. I mean, I'll put the Greek letters there, but then I go in there and I explain what this Greek phrase means, what this word means, and how you can increase your Catholic faith by knowing those little intricacies of scripture. That's what I do in those commentaries, you see. So, um, <clears throat> but I, if you want me to go back into history, my history, and tell you how it all started, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Is that what you want me to do? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, I was actually uh, um, going to be a doctor, a, a medical doctor, like my father. He was a general practitioner for uh, 40 years in a little town in southern Jersey. And they were priming me to be a, a doctor. I mean, he used to send money to Temple Medical School for years. So when I applied, you know, I, I greased my way through and um, so that's where I had my heart set on. And when I went to college, I was a um, physics major. I was a chemistry major. And, um, but that's when the Lord really came into my life in a, in a way that I will never forget. It's been many decades since then, but I still remember it. Like I'm talking to you right now, uh, this experience that I had in my college dormitory. Um, and maybe I should start from there. Um, if that doesn't bore you to death, um, um, I'll start from there. I was born and raised a Catholic. Okay. I uh, came from an Italian Catholic family. My grandfather on, and grandmother on both sides came off the boat from Italy and it landed at Ellis Island and made their way, you know, whatever way it was. And it was tough for them, but they brought over their Catholic faith, but I have to say, except for my grandmother on my father's side, who used to go to mass every day and died in her sleep. I mean, this woman was a saint. Um, nobody in my family really took their faith to heart, you know, like you and I do, or Nina and Jesse does. And I hate to say this, but that's par for the course in Catholicism. You know, you've probably run into that yourself. You get Catholics to start talking about God and their eyes glaze over. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm a Catholic, but do, do I have to believe in God? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so on point. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I saw a movie once, uh, a father uh, talking to his two sons and, and his two sons were going off in life doing bad things. And his father says, now you can't do that stuff. You're Catholic. And they said to the father, what are you talking about? You don't even believe in God. And he goes, what difference does that make? <laughs> <laughs> I forget what movie it was, but I said, oh my gosh, if you could cap encapsulate a lot of Catholic families, that would be it right there. Yeah. Sadly. And anyway, my father was the same way. 
You know, he's put the yeah. Ten Commandments up on our bulletin board so we'd obey him. And he's just using the capital of the Catholic faith, but he didn't believe in God. Yeah. You know? I mean, <laughs> anyway, so that's the, that's the kind of environment I grew up in. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a friend in college, fresh when I was a freshman in college, his name is Bill, Bill Bryan. I still remember his name to this day. One of these uh, blonde haired, blue eyed, angel like, guys you want me once in your life could do no wrong you know and he knew jesus and his whole family knew jesus and i didn't and one day bill and i were in some kind of conversation or whatever and he was reading this bible and i asked him hey can i have that can i read that and he said yeah so it was a well, today we call it the good news for modern man bible or today's english version i mean very easy to read I had little stick figures in there where you know jesus oh, yeah. talking to people anyway it was just very easy to read you, once you started reading you couldn't put it down because it was so it's like reading the reader's digest um anyway um i read i started to read that book and um i had no idea no no um predilection no intuition no foresight that i was going to have my life changed i had just no idea and uh so i read the bible six months later i was in my college dorm at uh, george washington university and um my life wasn't going i wasn't doing that well in school for some reason i was lonely um just a lot of things just weren't right you know and I was reading the Bible, and I came to uh, the passage in, Ma in, in Mo uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, my burden is light. You know the, the verse. And it was just as if, no, no, no. That was at night. That was uh, about, say, 10 o'clock at night I read that and I, I got tired I put down the, the Bible and I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and I remember this distinctly I woke up I was laying down on my back I, I stood up or I sat up rather and I looked around the room and I said to myself I am not the same person I was when I went to sleep the night before. It was, it, it was just as if Jesus was in the room. I didn't see anything, okay? But it was just as if Jesus was in the room. And he said, remember that verse you read, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. And I was saying yes in my mind. And well, that's the reason you feel this way this morning. And it was such, I now, now I know what the saints feel when they talk about you know meeting god and I, I it was just such an overwhelming thing and my whole life just changed instantly they're just like wow um and so at that point and oh, <laughs> I, I started to give away everything i own because i wanted to be just like jesus you know i had stereos and all kinds of i even gave my car away um, I had a fancy car that I was driving and uh, gave that away. And I became a joke in the dormitory because the guys would all line up at my door wondering what I was going to give away next because I just wanted to get rid of everything. And I told them, I said, I just want to give away everything. I just want to be poor and, and follow Jesus. And they're going, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and most of the guys that were in my dorm were Jewish. Um, at, at uh, George Washington University. I think there was only one Gentile guy and I became good friends with him, but he, uh, we, we, we didn't see each other after a while, but at any rate, uh, the Jewish guys were happy to take the stuff off this Christian guy. He just turned to a Jesus freak, you know? So at any rate, um, you know, I, I was just totally enthralled and every morning I woke up, it was like the same thing. Oh my gosh, I'm a new person. Now what am I going to do? And nobody had talked to me. Nobody had encouraged me. Nothing. It was just 
me and the Lord through the Bible. And uh, wow, um, I just enjoy telling that experience because it, it was just so enthralling. And then, of course, comes the next part, which is now what am I going to do? And so I didn't know exactly what to do because I didn't have anybody to talk to there. Nobody was Christian there. So I said, all right, well, let me just try to go back to the Catholic Church. I mean, that's all I know. And I started to go to Mass again. I hadn't been for a year or two. And everything started to make sense to me. I was hearing the Mass and like, wow. If you really take this stuff to heart, what the priest is saying, you know, when he says, you know, this is my body, take and eat, you know, what does that really mean? You know, and I'm, I'm searching like, wow, what does that really mean? You know, <laughs> take and eat. What? <laughs> and I didn't have any answers, of course, because I didn't even talk to the priest. Of course, uh, it, it's kind of hard to find a priest that will take the time to talk to you. That's that's for certain. But um so I was going back to the Catholic Church and really found out that, wow, this is what they're talking about. You know, this is the faith. And I was all by myself. I lived in my own apartment. And I was still a, a pre-med major in, in chemistry, physics. And I started to listen to Protestant radio. And there was a guy that I've, who, who I eventually worked for seven years later, who had a two-hour call-in program. You ask him questions, he gives you answers over the phone uh, or on his program. And I'd religiously went to this program every Saturday from, I think, 8 to 10 or something, because that was the only source I could find for somebody who really wanted to give teaching from the Bible. And the Bible had changed my life. And I said, wow, if the Bible can do this, I want to dedicate my life to studying the Bible because this thing is powerful. And he'd give his answers. Of course, they were all Protestant answers. And I didn't know any better. And when somebody tells you, oh, the Catholic Church, come on, you know, they're steeped in tradition. You know, they do all the bells and smells and all the saints and this idols and statues and all this stuff. Come on. I got the simple religion for you. Just read the Bible. And there you have it. And, you know, the Bible changed my life. So what was I going to say? You know, you're wrong. And uh, so I followed this guy. And um, but I, I got to know the Protestant religion pretty well from that because I, I, I would get jobs while I was going to school at a, a small hotel that had very little business. And I would work there from uh, 11 at night to seven in the morning and then go to school during the day, believe it or not. And don't ask me when I found time to sleep. I eventually found time to sleep. But uh, so from 11 to seven, what are you going to do at a hotel with no business? Well, I read the Bible. <laughs> okay. And that went on for like seven, eight years or so. And uh, I became thoroughly familiar with the Bible, just reading it, studying it. I took voluminous notes and, um, you know, just the, the whole nine yards. And, um, and so I was a, I became a card carrying Protestant, you know, and I worked my way up the chain of command, so to speak. And I eventually became an elder in one of these Bible churches, you know, and used to preach from the pulpit and um, give, you know, spiritual advice to people and all kinds of things. And so uh, I was quite involved. And um, the guy that I told you I eventually worked for was out in California. He had a radio station. And I worked at that radio station and had a national radio program and I had a Bible course that I created. Uh, man, I was just doing everything that, you know, you, you would do if you had um, the, the background that I had. And um, two other guys worked at that station with me. And they're both Catholic now. Nice. So, you, you know, there's a story behind this, right? <laughs> so, so they're working at this radio station. 
they become Catholic and I hadn't seen them in a while. And one of them was named Jerry. The other was named Bob, like me. People called me Bob. And um, so Jerry wants to get a hold of Bob and uh, he calls my number by mistake. And he, he, I answer the phone, I go, hello. And he goes, hi, this is Jerry. I go, hi, Jerry, haven't seen you in a long time. And he thinks I'm the other Bob, right? He's talking to. <laughs> and so he goes, remember that thing we did the other day, blah, 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 blah. And I go, no, Jerry, I haven't seen you in about two years. What's going on? He goes, oh, this isn't Bob Swenson. This is Bob Sengenis. I said, yeah, you got Bob Sengenis. He goes, oh, while I have you on the phone, let me, uh, wh I said, what have you been doing? And he goes, uh, well, I, I've become a Catholic. I go, what? A Catholic? And he goes, yeah. So I, so I was just going to give him maybe five minutes and then politely hang up the phone and say, nice talking to you, Jerry. Have a nice life. Because the last thing I wanted to do was become Catholic. And, um, and I said, all right, well, just tell me briefly, you know, what, what brought you to the Catholic Church, blah, 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 blah. So he proceeds to tell me. And then an hour and a half later, we're still on the phone. Okay. He's telling me about his Catholic faith. And the last thing he talked about was the communion of saints in the Catholic Church. And I'm saying, okay, all right. And as he's talking, I feel, okay, I didn't see anything, but I, I felt that there were all these saints in my living room lining the wall of my living room, watching this conversation go on. And I said, Jerry, I said, something strange is happening. I don't know. I, I don't see anything, but I feel it like, you know, some, you know, somebody's in the room, but you can't see them. And, he, and I said, I feel like all these saints are around watching us talk. He goes, that's what I'm telling you. It's the communion of saints. <laughs> you know, just, like, <laughs> just like, you know, he's eating, the, you know, a lunch or something. It's just natural for him. Yeah, it's the communion of saints. Oh, of course, Jerry. <laughs> And uh, I said, I, I, you know, I said, look, I, I got to go. I just feel really strange. I got to go. And I'll think about what happened. Think about what you said. But thanks for calling. It was nice to, to uh, talk to you again, blah, blah, blah. And we hang up the phone. And the next day, he calls Bob Swenson, who he originally wanted to get in touch with, and says, guess what? Um, I just talked to Bob Sanchez about us becoming Catholic. And he listened to me for an hour and a half and he thought he saw all saints in his living room. <laughs> so anyway, so they come knocking on my door oh, man. the next day. And, and, and I saw them there through the window and I go, Oh gosh, what did I do? And I open the door. Oh, Jerry, nice to see you. Gee, I wonder what's bringing you over here. And they had this box in their hand, right? <laughs> box full of books. And uh, just said, well, listen, you know, we know you, you and Jerry talked and we just wanted to, uh, you know, give you some information. That's it. Just information. It's all it is. It's not going to come out and bite you. And they knew me, you know, they knew I wasn't hard. I mean, I wasn't easy to convince of something unless I really believed it. And I said, all right, do this. Just leave the books there at the door. If I have time, I'll look through them and, you know, we'll see what happens. You go, okay, no problem. No problem. Just put, they put the books down. They politely went off and see you later. And I had no intention of reading those books. Okay. Um, so I'm going by, so I, I did actually take the box and put it on the inside of the door, so the outside of the door. And so I, as three, three days go by and I'm walking by this box of books and I'm just sort of looking in there saying, what the, what did they bring me, you know? And I saw this one little red book in there and um, I said, oh, that looks harmless. Let me just pick that book out. It's not, it was like about this thick. And I said, it looks fine. Let me, let me read that, you know, see if I can dust these guys off. And, and uh, so I started reading it. It was a book written by Cardinal Gibbons called The Faith of Our Fathers. 
Nice. I love that book. That's one of my favorite yeah. books. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And uh, I still have the little red version. Where is that thing? It's on my bookshelf back there. The little, it's only about this big or so. And it's a little red book. We just call it the little red book. And I started reading that. And I had never read something like this where he's actually acting as a Catholic apologist. Yeah. And he's saying, okay, here's the Protestant objection. Here's the Catholic answer. And the answer he gave was like, at this time, and I was very spiritually minded. And, and I knew what all the questions were. I just didn't know what all the answers were. And he was giving me the answers. And I'm going, wow, why did I never see this before? And so I couldn't put the book down. And I read it and I completed it in three days. And in three days, I wanted to become a Catholic. Now that to me, that was just like absurd. Considering I had been in the Protestant churches in and out of five, six, seven, eight churches, um, you know, because they all disagree with one another, of course, you, you, you think you're going to get comfortable and then whop, you know, doctrine comes up and, well, I can't believe in that, you know, and so you go find another church that, you know, they will accept your belief. So yeah. it's an unending process. Mm -hmm. um, so um, after 18 years of that, it's like, I never thought I would change. Uh, so, but I did. And um, uh, I wanted to become a Catholic. It was like St. Paul's little experience, you know, where he's blind for three days. And then all of a sudden, God took the scales off his eyes and he could see and everything made sense to him. And then he went off on his, you know, missionary journeys and stuff. Yeah. So um, that's how I got back to the Catholic church. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> was for two guys that became Catholic and knew me and were very polite and just gave me the books because I knew I liked to read books and there it was and that was uh, back in 1992 so wow. what do you Catholic think you know when you read that book what do you think was kind of the first thing about it that stuck out to you while you were reading it? Was there a specific topic where something just clicked or, uh, and by the way, that was the first book I read as well when I no was becoming kidding. Catholic. So yeah, oh, it was the first book I read. My mom gave it to me and it was just game over once I read it. Wow. Well, Nina, I'm so glad you told me that because nobody's ever told me that. I know <laughs> that book became very popular. But nobody's ever told me that they've been moved so much by that book. So Oh, I, I just, that. it's profound. You know, yeah. it just, there's just no way to even refute it is the thing. It just, um, just, it, it really takes every Protestant objection and shines so much light on it. And it's like, well, you know, I, I've never thought of it that way. How can I even argue with it? Yeah. Um, I so remember I love my, that book. you asked me the one part that, grabbed me the most i think it was when he was talking about the eucharist yeah because even as a catholic i didn't believe this piece of bread could be god mm -hmm. i mean you just accepted it because you were catholic but you really didn't know what you were doing you know i remember talking to a baptist guy and he said you know if i really believed that that little wafer was jesus christ I'd be crawling up on my knees to receive it every week instead of just walking up there, you know? Yeah. And, you know, Catholics don't really know what they have. In so many this. take it for granted. Yeah. Yeah. Take it for granted. And um, that's what I did for so many years. And my family did too. You know, we just did what you did as a Catholic. That's all there was to it, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you happen to understand it along the way, well, bully for you you know yeah. but you just did what catholics did and maybe that's good you know in a way that's good because that corrals everybody at least that's where the gospel is and you know some are going to get it some are you know and the way it turns out is most of them don't get it and just a few do and that's the way the gospel works i'm just yeah, happy yeah. to be a part of that small group that you know actually saw it thanks to the grace of god and uh, changed my life. And that was 45 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So, wow. 
Yeah. Did you get a lot of pushback when you started telling people that you were going to become Catholic? No, no. <laughs> no, not a person in the world. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, because, uh, what do you call it? Um, Nina's been told everything in the book. By, oh, by yeah. Her, yeah. Protestant friends. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I had a whole group of Protestant friends because when working at that radio station for two years, I think it was, I was very popular and I had a lot of friends, a lot of friends that I taught the Protestant faith to, um, hundreds, hundreds of them and thousands across the nation that knew me by name. You know, I would grade their test papers in my national correspondence course. And so I would, I would, was very well known and the, but the, just the ones in California, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, um, they just ripped me to shreds. Like, how could you ever do something like this? And um, not only that, but the two families that were Catholic with me, Bob Swenson and Jerry Hoffman, the ones who introduced me to the Catholic Church, they had some very bad things happen in their life. Like Bob's wife died. And he was very close to her. She died like two years later. Jerry's kids were in an accident and they were messed up. And so talk about testing of their faith. Man, these people went through it. And I had a very bad, I don't even want to talk about it. Okay, mm. very bad experience. And um, uh, so we, we were tested and we passed the test. And here we are today talking about it. But as far as persecution was concerned, my goodness, um, even my family, you know, I, I, I moved back east where my family originated from, uh, from California. And I said, oh, my family's Catholic. It's going to be glorious, you know, and we can all talk about the faith and blah, 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 blah. Are you kidding? It's, it's like, like I told you, you know, yeah, we're Catholics, but we don't believe in God. You know, that's, that was the th theme running through their whole system. And so trying to get through that was impossible. Mm -hmm. And so they rejected me and um, it got really bad. And so it just didn't work and I left, you know? Yeah. So yeah, persecution everywhere in every shape, form you can imagine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. if I could ask too, I mean, so you converted, you said officially in 92, so roughly around that time. Yeah. So what, at what point did you start deciding, like, I'm going to start writing not by faith alone or not? I mean, like these, these, these masterpiece books on apologetics, because those just came a few years later, right? I mean, how did that all, what, what motivated you to want to start writing about justification and studying it? And I mean, all of that stuff, because you, you definitely then got way into the apologetics world, of course, after that. Well, um, there was another friend of Jerry's and Bob's, uh, his name was Constantino. And he said to me uh, at the same place where Jerry and Bob stood in my front door and said, you know, Bob, you write very well and you communicate very well and you need to do that for the Catholic church. And I said, oh, maybe that's what God wants me to do because I had never thought about it before. And he knew me from all my work that I did at the radio station because I wrote books, you know, did radio and all that. And I said, no, well, I said, I haven't the slightest idea where to go and what to do, but maybe you got a point there. So, you know, push came to shove. And a few years later, I, I met the right people. And, and I was sort of like a loner. I mean, I could, I could sit like I do at my desk here for eight hours without talking to anybody because I'm just so absorbed in my work. You know, I'm just one of those kind of guys. <clears throat> so it doesn't bother me to sit for a long period of time and write. Mm -hmm. And, and I, one of my friends, uh, new friends, uh, Patrick Madrid, uh, we became very close at, at my conversion and he helped a lot in getting me to the right people. And he said, uh, he, I, I said to him one day, I said, you know, RC Sproul, have you, have you ever heard of RC Sproul, Joe? Yes. Yeah. He just died a few years ago. Anyway, very prominent Protestant guy who wrote a book called um, Saved by Faith Alone or something like that. Yeah. And I showed Pat that. He goes, 
why don't you write a book called Not by Faith Alone? Mm. And I said, now there's an interesting idea. And so that's what I did. This was in 1996. Yeah. Pat and I were doing programs on EWTN and um, other places. And um, that's where it started. So I said, okay. And, but I didn't realize how big the book was going to be yeah. because I didn't realize how big of a topic this was. And then when I finally got into it, I go, oh my gosh, I could see why there's a controversy. Yeah. I could see now. And now God's giving me the opportunity to, to write about it because I knew how the Protestants thought. Yeah. I was there for 18 years. I knew the questions before they even asked them. And now I could answer them because I had the truth. Yeah. I had the Catholic truth. And that's what I had to believe first. That the Catholic Church was guided by the Holy Spirit into all truth, and that truth was infallible. Yeah. If I didn't have that, I would be just as confused as anybody else out there, believe me. Yeah. Wait, what? Because people often ask me, how could you read a book like Not by Faith Alone? I said, look, it's easy. Once you have the answer, all you have to do is explain it to people. Yeah. <laughs> you just know the answer is right. You're not struggling yeah. to get the truth, you see. Yeah. This is explaining it. <laughs> Right. Yeah. There you yeah go. Wow, that's a thick book. <laughs> um, well, here's the condensed one, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the condensed um, one. Yeah. Um, when you've gone to explain it to people that are, you know, specifically anti-Catholic, have you ever been able to convince anybody of it? And what do you think is the biggest barrier um, with specifically anti-Catholics, even if you give like the most um, solid answer? Um, there have been many people that I have, they write to me all the time. Yeah. Sometimes once a week, I'll get somebody who says, oh my gosh, you moved me. I was non-Catholic for my whole life and suddenly I saw the truth. I mean, hundreds of people and that's what keeps me going. Yeah. And then there's thousands that I've talked to that it doesn't make any difference what I say to them. Sometimes I'll get them thinking and they won't be able to come up with an answer, but they're still going to hold on, you know, because they hate the Catholic church. And I hated the Catholic church too. When I was a Protestant, I wouldn't even talk about Catholics because I thought they were so weird. Okay. So I can understand how they feel. And that's why I think I can be useful to them. And that's why God allows me to talk to them because look, I know what you're thinking. I was there yeah. and I tell yeah. them that, you know, um so that a little opens them up but sometimes they just you know they just they don't take that next step you know uh but they do enough where i'm encouraged that my work is good and it's it's being used of god effectively so mm. am right. i answering your question or did you want something yeah no okay. absolutely okay yeah um well i was well uh, i was gonna ask you too based off that if you can remind me, Robert, isn't there a debate that you were a part of where something like a dozen people converted after, like, right after the debate finished? Is that the one, I think it was like you, Marshner, Madrid, or is that one, it was you and James White? I don't really remember, but there was one where like a dozen people converted to the Catholic faith after. Yeah, that was a debate that we had, me, Madrid, and, and Bill Marshner from Christendom College back in 1995. And we had it in California, and we were against one of my former seminary professors, Protestant right. seminary professors, Robert Godfrey. And then there was Rod Rosenblatt, a, uh, a Lutheran. And I forget was the other guy. I forget the other guy. Anyway, uh, it's funny how numbers increase after so many years, but there was only six. There were six people that uh, converted right there on the spot to Catholicism after that debate. So wow. Wow. Um, that, that's what showed me this, this works, you know, apologetics yeah. works because, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I, I want to ask a different question, but finish what you were going to say. <laughs> um, I forget what I was going to say. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I know cause, and now because I'm curious about this because I, I know that debate dealt with authority. Well, it's two part authority and justification. Part, yeah. Right. But now on the authority issue, okay, one thing that I've said for years that I, I originally heard from you is you have a very unique argument against sola scriptura, 
that you even I used to say better than the canon of scripture issue, <laughs> um, which it is. And here's the thing I've, I've told people, when you really understand what the argument is, it's almost like irrefutable when you're talking to somebody. I've used it many, many times. I'm just wondering if you can share it in your own words, you know, th that that argument that you use against Sola Scriptura. We're, we're all familiar with the canon issue. That's why, you yeah. know, but this is like a very unique approach, I think. Can well, you for remind those me? listening, for those listening that have never heard of the canon issue, you may want to uh, like say what that is first and then go from there. Yeah, the canon issue is how did we get the Bible, basically? How do we yeah. know? That the 27 books in the New Testament and 73 in the Old are actually the Bible. Who, who authorized that? And who has the right to authorize it? And when they authorize it, does that mean it's perfect in the sense of there's no mistakes, that there's a book there that shouldn't be there maybe, or we're missing a couple of books? I mean, how do we know this thing is actually, you know, that's what I told the Protestants, I say, you know, you go up to your pulpit and you wave your Bible and you say, the word of God says, and then that just begs the question, how do you know it's the word of God? You're, did Martin Luther tell you, John Calvin, you know, Holdrick Zwingli, and what authority do they have? Did Jesus come down and talk to them and say, and give them information about what the canon is? No. Okay, well, when did he do that? Because that's the only way it's going to work. The only way it's going to work is if heaven somehow gives us that information. And then we can trust the Bible and wave the Bible and say, thus saith the Lord. If not, forget it. And if I didn't have that assurance, and this was the first time I actually thought about it, but if I didn't have that assurance that the Bible I was holding was actually the Bible, I would never be in this mess doing this work yeah. because I can never be sure. Yeah. Uh, so basically that's kind of the argument. Is that the argument you're referring to, Joe? Uh, so there no, <laughs> there is an argument that you have on Sola Scriptura where you say, and I don't want to butcher it because you, you explain it better, but it essentially has to do with how can any verse of scripture be teaching soul scriptura if it's being written at a time when soul scriptura is not being practiced because divine oral revelation is still occurring as of the writing is it does that is that am i saying that correctly yeah you are saying it correctly yeah um um yeah i mean how do you refute that i mean because if it's a catch-22 situation for them mm -hmm. if they say there's no oral revelation well, they just denied what the Bible says, because the Bible talks about all revelation in many places. Mm -hmm. And then if they say, well, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe your argument. Well, how can you not believe it? Okay, how can you have all revelation around the church at that time and then say you have a closed canon of scripture? Mm -hmm. Okay, God still get. how do you know there's just not another book that's going to be at it? All revelation could have given us that too. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the point I was making with Nina, which is the only way that we can be sure that the canon is the canon is by an infallible dissemination of information. And what does that come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. That's who that's what he Jesus said. Mm -hmm. I will lead you into all truth. And the, the truth that we better have if we're going to go out there and preach the Bible is that the Bible's the Bible. And the only way we could get that is through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works through the leaders of the church. And so well, that's why the doctrine of infallibility works hand in hand with this. And that's because in order for the Pope to give an infallible decision on what the canon is, he has to be prompted by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Somehow, some way, that has to happen. Otherwise, I would not be a Catholic today if that was not true. You right. see, this is, this is an all or nothing game that we're in. It's either all true or it's all false. And there's no in between. And the only way it can be all true is if we have this dissemination of information from heaven that like was given to Peter, for example, 
you know, in Matthew chapter 16, when he says, you're the son of God. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, well, that didn't come to you from flesh and blood. That came to you from God the Father. Yeah. So there we have the precedent that the Pope's going to be our leader and declare for us through the Holy Spirit what the exact truth is. Yeah. Well, I love, too, how a point that I learned from you years ago is the whole thing of our Lord telling St. Peter, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And Titus 1 verse 2 teaches us that God cannot lie. So whatever Peter binds has to be true. Otherwise, yeah. would, God can't bind a lie in heaven. And that right there is like the biblical foundation of papal infallibility right from that passage, which is yeah. amazing. When I tell that to people, they just like their mouths are open. Go, <laughs> yeah, I just did, did that in my that? head. I was just like, <laughs> yeah, pretty, yeah. Amazing. pretty amazing. Um, so let me ask you this question then. Um, you've had, I've, well, you've had several debates with, for example, James White. Um, I mean, I was thinking of three, but now more just popped in my head. You've had several debates with him on different apologetic issues. Um, I know that you guys have never debated Sol Scriptura specifically, although I do know you've you opened a challenge to him. He just never responded. Yeah. Uh, one of the arguments that he likes to make, and I hear I've heard this now more so from Protestants over the years, is First Timothy three fifteen. We talk about the church being the pillar and foundation of the truth, and White likes to say, "Well, all a pillar and a foundation does is hold something else up. That's all it can do. And so what it's doing is it just holds up the, tr the, the truth of the scriptures." Um, now I'm just, you know, what is your thought on an argument like that? Cause that's something I keep hearing more so from Protestants lately. Um, well, it does hold up the scriptures. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't argue with that, but that, that doesn't mean that it holds up the scripture alone. Okay. You know, he, what he has to prove to us is that the pillar and foundation of the truth doesn't hold up the magisterium or tradition. And he can't. First of all, it's not even talked about in that passage. Okay. And second of all, he's throwing scripture in there in that passage. And he's choosing that. Uh, and he's choosing that because he wants that to be the only thing that the church holds up. But where's he getting that from? Well, he's getting it from some pre understanding that scripture is alone the authority and he's just throwing it into that verse. I mean, you can't do that. That's not exegeting the passage, that's eisegeting it. In other words, you've got a preconceived idea, and then you throw that into the passage, and, and, and you distort the passage, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he would love it for that passage to say, Scripture is a foundation in truth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or pillar, yeah well, I took a, he would love to say, he would love it to say, Scripture is the pillar and foundation of the truth. But I it does it, and that kills him. That kills him. Yeah. yeah. I took a poll on Instagram recently and I have it like a decent following. And I had asked, um, you know, it just says like a quiz, like a pop quiz question. What is the pillar and foundation of truth? And I put like the church and the Bible and like 80% of people put the Bible and, you yeah. know, they were just shocked that it said the church. But the thing is um, that I do find, you know, and all Protestants obviously give a different answer. Um, you know, when you show them verses, you know, like if, if he doesn't listen to the church, let him be a pagan or a tax collector, or, you know, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. People will either explain it as, oh, well, we're all the church, or they'll just say, well, you know, the church just means us. And it's like, well, that doesn't really fly because we all have a different um, interpretation of, you know, truth. So there has to be one set pillar. There has to be, there has to actually be be truth in existence um and I, I do find that that confuses them but there's always kind of a way to just you know brush it away yeah that the, the main problem i see with protestants is they have this nebulous idea of the church sort of ethereal spiritual entity that they don't want to define any tighter than that because that will require them to submit to a physical entity and I tell them, look, the spiritual side of the church that you believe in is fine, but you also have to have a physical legal side, you see, uh, physical and legal in the sense that like your family, you have a father and mother and children, and the state looks at them as legal entities. The father is responsible for the family. If something goes wrong, he's got to pay for it. The mother's responsible to take care of her children. If she doesn't, the CPS will be in there to take them out. They can do that legally, you see. 
The children are responsible to go to school until they're age 16. These are the legal um, structures that are built of the family. So it's not just a, a, a general idea that, oh, we're going to get together and have a family. No, this is a legal entity that's defined. And that's what the Catholic Church is. That's why you have to have an authority structure, because that's what makes it legal. That's yeah. what, and that physical entity makes it legal. So you have the Pope, the Cardinals, the bishops, the priests, the deacons, blah, 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 blah. And they all work together in this legal framework, yet that legal framework is also spiritual, you see. So mm -hmm. you have to have both. If you don't have both, you don't have a church. And especially you figure as heresies crop up like century after century, where are you going to go for the actual final decision on what is it, what is true and what is not? I, I remember you were talking in one debate. Um, I might have been against William Polk. Or I forget who it was, but you one of your questions you asked was, does Christ have one will or two? And he didn't know the answer and said, well, I think he has one. And he said, OK, there you go. That's a four. That's a fifth century heresy. You just you just committed a heresy right now. He didn't know. Yeah. You know, so yeah, wh where are you going to go? And that's why our Lord says in Matthew 18, ultimately you take it to the church. So, you know, wh what are they supposed to do with their mechanism? <laughs> yeah. And, and that question, that question that was started by Pope Honorius, because he's the one that wrote to Sergius of the East and said, Christ has one will. Well, that became a big issue because the whole church was questioning the doctrine of in papal infallibility yeah. because of that one error. And they said the way they solved the problem was, okay, Honorius did not say this officially from the chair of Peter. He just wrote a personal letter to Sergius and made this error. And so they said, this does not affect papal infallibility, but that's how big that one little issue was, yeah. whether Christ had one will or two wills, whoever thinks about that. Yeah. Nobody ever thinks about whether Christ had one will or two wills. You go on your day and you might think about it once or twice in your life and that's it. But this is important for the doctrine of papal infallibility for sure. And we figured it out then and that carried the church all the way through because that was the last instance that came up where they had said, okay, how do we define infallibility? You know, how are we going to hold the church together? And they put it together and they made this, this great distinction between officially teaching and privately teaching. Yeah, well, I, I love how you always say to Protestants, you always say, if you can find one dogma that's changed in 2000 years, I'll become a Protestant again. Yeah. Because they can't find one. Can't find one, yeah. You, you know, they'll come up with something, oh, well, the church changed it, but that's not a dogma. Yeah. I, I, I'm talking about established official doctrine of the church. Can you find one? Nobody's been able to find one. You see, like I told you before, this is an all or nothing game. So I'm not afraid to say challenges like that. Because yep. I don't know, maybe they might come up with something. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, yeah. Nobody's ever been able to. But I'll give you that challenge because I'm willing to take the risk. I've put my life on the line for this church. And it's because I think it has the truth. Yep. Okay. So I've taken the risk. And, and, and that, that's the reason I can give you that challenge. And fortunately, it's worked out to my favor because nobody's been able to answer that. <laughs> yeah. um, well, uh, you know, I know we have a few minutes remaining. Um, did you want to let people know, for example, how they can find you? Like, I know you're go you go live frequently on YouTube to with uh, open format Q&A. Yeah, to tonight, you know? actually, we're having that program tonight. That's um, It starts at 8 o'clock Eastern time, an hour from now, and it goes till 10. And it's just a Q&A session. They ask questions, and I try to answer them the best I can. And um, that's every Wednesday. Yeah. And um, that's on, uh, what's, the, what's the channel? Um, Holy Family, is it? Oh, uh, it's Holy Faith Media. Holy Faith Media, yeah. yeah. So they can look that up and, and go. And um, it's growing very, very well. And I'm, I'm so happy to do it for people. Yeah, and you get all sorts of questions on, I mean, religion, apologetics, theology, history, science, yeah. politics. I mean, people ask you all sorts of things. So, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, really good. So uh, there you go. So it's all available. And then uh, my website is robertsongenis.org.com.net. All three of them work. And we have all kinds of books there. You get not by faith alone, not by scripture alone. 
and I have 50 other books that are available and we have DVDs and all kinds of good things. So. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, all right, Jesse, did you want to, uh, anything you want to add or comment or before? Yeah, you absolutely. I mean, I'll just wrap up a little bit, I guess. I, I really just uh, related a lot to your, you know, your story, um, huh. um, your love for the Bible and how the Bible just, you know, drew, drew you to truth. So, cause that was my experience as well. You know, I you know, grew up Protestant and, you know, it's, you know, it's just amazing. Um, so like, I really like that. And I did have other questions, but I was enjoying just listening. So, um, it's great to hear your story. So. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Dan, thank you again, Robert, so much for taking the time to come on and be on a podcast and hopefully we could have you as a guest again sometime in the future, you know? Nina, I want a special request to you. Oh, yes. All right. Um, you're about, I have a daughter, approximately your age. How old do you think I am? Uh, 25, maybe. I'm 28, but yes. All right. Around the same age, yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, you're two years younger than her. And she's having a struggling time with whatever faith she has. Mm -hmm. And I, I want you to pray for her if you yeah. would do that for me. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All What's right. her name, if you don't mind me asking? Um, no, I don't mind. Her name is Brianna. Brianna, I'll pray yeah. for her for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, All right. Anything yeah, else? Well, Jesse, you want to close with the prayer? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Amen. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thanks Thank for you doing guys. English, Jesse. <laughs> 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 well, well, thank you, you Robert. Yeah, thank All you right, so thank much, you, Robert, Nita. for coming so on. So nice to meet you. All right. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Great.